further ado, I just wanted to get started. I appreciate your time again, Steve. I know you're a busy man. Um, you know, Steve graduated with a master's of science degree from University of Maryland, where he studied and worked with Dr. Dernoden, Dr. Kaminsky, uh, currently up at Penn State. But while at University of Maryland, Steve worked for three years as the turf diag uh, disease diagnostic lab and received hundreds of samples per year. He's been involved in a number of trials, probably hundreds at this point, that he conducts himself at his own farm and, uh, and does work with gray leaf spot, dollar spot, herbicides, plant growth regulators, the management of poania and cool season turf. He's done a bunch of work with biostimulants, fertilizers, fungicide combinations, herbicides, and, and cultural practices, as many of us know. Uh, Steve visits over 200 now or 300 now, Steve, uh, courses a year. Uh, the number keeps going up from what I hear talking to you, but I uh, appreciate you coming on today to talk about native areas and managing weeds and insects in, in these areas. So it's a topic, a hot topic of discussion amongst the golf course superintendents. Uh, appreciate you again. Uh, I know you're busy and thank you so much for partnering with us and, and doing this webinar. No problem, Eric. Thanks uh, to you and the guys from Landscape Supply for the invitation. This is a Maybe people may have heard this before, but fine fescues and native area management, something's very dear to me. When I was at Philly, that Philly Country Club in the late 90s and early 2000s, we methyl bromide at about four acres of putting greens and basim at about 35 acres of fairways. And the club president kind of looked at us, we were done that and said, what's next, right? What next was fine fescues establishment and maintenance. And I think many golf course superintendents have kind of taken that same approach. You know, how do I continuously improve my golf course from a visual standpoint? How do we make positive changes? And because of that, many golf course superintendents are interested in fine fescue and native area management. So I want to highlight that these are not wetting areas, right? So it's, it's interesting. A golf course superintendent could have a well-maintained, you know, wetting facility and then 100 feet away have a fine fescue area that they're trying to maintain thin and wispy. So you need to really think about your goals of these areas. Are they supposed to be in play? Are they more visually, aesthetically pleasing? Uh, so really consider all that and just throw a wedding photo in there as, a, as an interesting uh, contrast. So a uh, quick advertisement for myself. I hate doing this, but some of you guys know I'm, I'm doing weekly videos from, from March to October. I just record my video for this week and actually talk about some interesting and very controversial topics that will be released on Saturday. Uh, those of you that already subscribed, thank you for that. Uh, if you want more information on it, uh, take a quick photo of that QR code there and you should get a link to the information for that website. So fine fescues, there's actually six subspecies, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. We mostly focus on the har, the chewings. Uh, we don't focus a lot right now on the, on the strong creepers, right, because they tend to get too thick. But here's a photo I took this past June at my facility. And here we have three different species of fine fescue. One block is mowed, one block is unmowed, right? So we'll leave this un unmowed block for visuals. And here we have a, a straight har there top left, a straight sheep's there in the forefront, and then a um, strong chewings there in the back. You see the chewings actually produces less seeds and actually has a little greener hue to it. Many people use chewings fescue for, for their divot mix for bent grass fairways, for example, and it's actually a very green grass, even at fairway and tea height. Uh, but you see there's lots of different variations in these. Many, many people ask me all the time, you know, uh, does it matter if I'm getting a hard or a sheep's or a chewings? That doesn't matter as much as the, what the hards do the best from a visual standpoint uh, from seed head production and turning that straw color, as I called it, that looks like dormant Bermuda grass, clean dormant Bermuda grass in Father's Day week, usually in the middle of June. So consider your purposes here, right? Is it your purpose to reduce mowing, right? Uh, is it architectural? Is it a feature? Is it going to be in play? And then how's it going to look? And then also all these doing these for environmental reasons. One of the things I would definitely not suggest using fine leaf fescues for is drainage basins. Typically fine fescues like it dry. I actually had a golf course this week that they did uh, 13 acres of fine fescue establishment and then Hurricane I, um, Ian came in. Obvious what germinated and what didn't germinate. It was, it was actually within two weeks they identified the areas that they really knew they weren't gonna be able to get fine fescue and have it do well. Uh, and they basically are gonna go back in and those areas of tall fescue. They're, they're, they were already killed with Roundup. Is it a buffer between holes, right? And also consider pollinators, right? When high rough areas become playable features of the golf course, many golfers expect to basically find their golf ball and maybe it's a half to one shot penalty. These areas, most sites will cost more per square foot herbicides, labor and maintain maintenance to, to them mowing rough, right? So what I'm getting at is mowing a rough is a lot simpler than trying to keep a 
Try and fescue or a native area or naturalized area clean of weeds as well as playable. It's very difficult and very costly. The other interesting thing is if you begin to think about it, unfortunately, this is a golf course in Philadelphia that went out of business. It's going to become homes here soon. And I went back and walked that property about 18 months after they stopped mowing grass. It's really crazy to understand how the, the pressure of mowing changes a landscape, landscape and the, the ecology, the ecosystem switches, right? We stop mowing these areas, it basically Bermuda grass, sedges, American burnweed, thistles, and aquatic plants begin to take over with the mowers, with, with lack of mowing. I, I taught my first class at Rutgers for the semester this past week, and I asked the students in Turf One, I said, where do you guys see more weeds and putting greens and, and uh, the rough? And pretty obvious, even entry-level turf uh, students realize that mowing is a pretty darn good weed control. So here's Bermuda grass, you know, it's ankle high with not being mowed for 18 months. It's dominating all bank grass and poe and rye grass that have been in that golf course under the absence of irrigation, low mowing, fungicides. I also want to point out there's many golf course landscapes that, that, that basically are already ready for thin, wispy, sandy sites, right? That's going to be a lot different than a golf course, say, in Baltimore or Virginia that has a heavy clay or a heavy loam soil. Here's Friar's Head. And this site's basically a sand dune. At Friar said the entire property can form, all, all the sand on that property conforms to USGA spec. The, those greens are basically just pushed up and piled up and they were grassed, right? Very little drainage was added. And landscapes like that, that's going to be a lot easier to maintain this thin, dunesy appearance that many golfers strive for. This past June, also, I went to, to Scotland to play some golf for six days. It was obvious that the fescues even in June in Scotland and Ireland, these places aren't growing quite a bit and they're in sandier sites, right? So uh, many people have this idea that you can just put a fine fescue out there and it's going to be thin and wispy. That's, that's I'm not true in most of our environments in the Mid-Atlantic. Also in the Northeast, you have rock, right? Here's a golf course in New Hampshire and fine fescue will do fine in these rock outcroppings, but realize it's going to take a lot of maintenance to hand spray small features like these, these mounds here, sort of that green at this golf course um, up in the Northeast. Now, one thing I'm seeing on a lot of fine fescues, it's at the edge of a parking lot where they expanded a big parking lot and they had a ton of crap soil, right? Rock and a ton, no topsoil. And uh, this area is gonna be a fine fescue. They were gonna let grow up during April, May, and June, and then basically mow it once or twice a month in the summertime area. Now, that makes also driving through these areas a lot easier and or more acceptable. One of the biggest challenges many golf course superintendents express is they don't wanna see tire tracks. And I oftentimes say, if you're going to drive through these areas, you know, after they, they begin to go to seed in, in May and early June, would you rather look at the weeds or chinch bug damage or the tire tracks, right? So driving through them is definitely more acceptable in spots like this here. The other big clear goal you want to have is you want to have clear goals, right? Are you going to have flowers or forbs in these areas? Or are you going to have 100% fine fescue? If you spray any broadleaf weed herbicide on this fine leaf fescue slash daffodil bed here, you're going to hurt the daffodils, right? So uh, trees and other plants, if you really want to do this right, you should consider your, your purposes here for, for these areas. Uh, typically, the best fine fescue and naturalized areas you're going to see are just grasses, like this here. Right? This is a high-quality fescue. This is basically what most golf course superintendents are going for, this brown appearance uh, come June. It's also thin enough that it's not going to lodge itself and lay over. Uh, in 2022, what happened in the Northeast, and I know that many of you in Virginia and Baltimore and D.C. areas, uh, Delaware probably also had some significant rainfall through August. So these fine fescues maybe lodged over from some rainfall. But in the Northeast this year, we, we had a, basically a drought from the third week of June until after Labor Day. And fine fescues actually did really well this year in comparison to a, a wetter year. We have that, that laying over and the, the lodging. And many golf courses in the Northeast that usually mow these areas down, say in August or September, they, they still have them up. They're probably going to mow after this rain now and, and apply some herbicides. But uh, here's what kind of most people are going for in the goal. So I have tr trouble with this and I'll, I'll get through this pretty quick, but you know, true native areas are going through succession. Like I showed you that picture of that golf course that stopped mowing, right? That's succession is a, is a basic ecology term that says that landscape's gonna go from a native uh, landscape into trees and then hardwoods, right? So uh, we're not doing that, right? So we're, we're mowing these areas, we're putting herbicides. We're basically preventing basic ecology from occurring and su succession from occurring by mowing and herbicides. No mow area is not a great term, even mow it once a year. Uh, I prefer using high grass area, right? So even if you have fescue mixed in with maybe a little blue stem or a little warm season native grasses in there, high grass area is, is good. Uh, I'm very careful using the term environmental area uh, because they, there's really, it should be a buffer if it's gonna be truly environmental, uh, but there's no great term for these. So high grass area or high rough area is typically what we do uh, use. 
Now, basic to weed control and high fescue this is basically uh, my, my considerations here is what's the age of the turf? What are your weed problems? Can you logistically spray them, right? So if you have to backpack them, are they on slopes that can't be driven safely? Also, if there's irrigation and soil moisture, a time of application is very important. Most of these herbicides I mentioned today, either should be watered in within a few days of application, or there needs to be adequate soil moisture for the herbicide to move in the plant. So and also some other logistical things here is how many times per year can you mow them? And maybe just focusing on in-play areas is something to think about. Maybe letting the, these out-of-play areas actually have more weeds in them or not mow them or not spray them as, as much, right? So I want to mention cultural weed control and manual weed, weed removal was a big tool for this. A drainage I already mentioned. Uh, if you are not already and you want to have thin, wispy, fine fescue areas, limit your water and fertilizer if you have not already. Uh, at a, a club a few years ago that told me they put a pound of nitrogen down in their high grass areas every year because they wanted to improve the seed head production. I, I, I said, a pound, that's a lot of N. I said, how long have you been doing that for? He goes, oh, I eat to 10 years. I said, it probably can go another 20 to 30 years with no fertilizer. So I need called me the following June and said, Steve, you were right. They did just as good as they've always done with no fertilizer on there. And also cultural weed control, you really want to think about mowing, right? The more you mow these areas, the better they are. The time of the year is very important, right? Most fine fescue turf, if you mow it in July when it's under heat stress, you can actually darn near kill it, right? We know simple things like putting chlorothalonil on fine fescues in the heat can actually damage them and thin them out. Uh, so really being careful with these grasses when you begin to get dry soils, daytime highs above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means that the best time to mow these is in the autumn and early spring. So I would say from right now through early May is probably the best time to mow a fine fescue high grass area. Springtime mowing does help. And I'll show you a photo of this. And you want to get all springtime mowing done before 1st of May in most years. Second week of May is pushing it. You may actually limit the seed head production. And the other thing to consider too, uh, if you can remove the debris, right? Uh, all these clippings, if you have any, some weeds out there, they're laying in the turf and doppers are coming through there, maybe off balls from there. Uh, also, if you can remove the debris, you're actually removing nutrients from the site. So some golf courses will uh, contract the hay farmer to come uh, bale it. Uh, some golf courses will, will windrow it with a hay rake themselves and put it in the back of workmen's and haul it away, uh, or gators and haul it away. But anytime you can remove that debris, you're, you're removing nitrogen from that system. It's like you do on fairways, tees, and greens, right? You remove clippings and blow them off. And uh, that's why you have to supply more fertility to those areas long term. Now, I visit a lot of golf courses, and I'll say it's super intent. Man, your high grass areas are really good. And the usual, usual response when they're really good is Steve, see those two guys right there, two girls right there. They spend a lot of time hand watering or hand weeding uh, or string trimming weeds down. And they pull weeds from these areas. So these two gentlemen here were walking through the high grass, picking American burn weed seedlings. That's obviously on a, on a golf course that has plenty of labor, plenty of, of time. Or if you can consider doing this during outings or when the golf course is very busy at play, is putting that, that labor shift into these areas if they're that important to you. Here's pulling American burn weed from high rough areas. So a, a big element, especially if you want to leave these areas up and not mow them, is manual weed control. The other thing I want to mention is I'm seeing more and more golf courses almost do this um, kind of naturally where they'll put an extra mow or two in May in these areas, like 15 foot off of, of primary rough areas. And this helps playability, right? What happens here is most of the balls that golfers will complain about or lose, they will say it was only a foot in, it was only two feet in, right? And I lost my ball, right? So uh, here you kind of give them the advantage to more mowing, probably better herbicide efficacy in these areas as well. Um, and also still give that aesthetic hue of the fine fescue kind of being that straw color in the summertime months, uh, but also impacting uh, speed of play as well as overall uh, aesthetics. Another interesting tool I'm seeing more and more is a weed amend in these areas. This is a vertical cutter, which we're still talking about cultural weed management, uh, but a vertical mower uh, weed amend Super 600 uh, in June, after the seed heads are produced and ran through at a higher height of cut, what it actually does is it actually can cut some of the weeds, it flail cuts some of the weeds and then pulls some of the seeds off the stalks. What's remained there is the stalk remains, it gives that really cool kind of hue color and uh, it's interesting to see, I'm seeing more uh, golf courses on flatter areas, not uh, slopes, not large, you know, uh, hills, uh, do this type of thing. And it, it does stripe it. People, some of the guys don't like the striping, but something to think about if you have one of these tools uh, from a cultural weed control standpoint, we'll knock a lot of weeds down thistle and it cuts that up pretty good and uh, definitely can give you some good aesthetics and, and less potential for these areas to lay over. As I mentioned many times, wet areas are not good for fescue. Typically, if you stand on a tee box of an area that you can see the drainage pattern, 
you have the thinnest fine fescues in those low lying areas. So uh, typically you'll see these areas really convert back this, this tall fescue sedge and then even Bermuda grass will thrive in these areas. So this would be an area, if you want this to be a very good fine fescue area, obviously that, that, that area that where water runs through there should be drained. Here's what typically happens. You can see water sitting there. Eastern fine fescue left and right of that drainage swale, but then you see tall fescue and yellow nut sedge and those wet spots. And our question I get about cultural weed management, density management, sand capping, right? And a lot of clubs, you know, have either extra bunker sand or they have a, an option to put some sand out. They want these areas to be really thin. This is actually a golf course up in the Northeast that had a um, drainage from a garage, a parking garage coming down to the golf course and they had to move some water and they, they put a big drainage pit and they capped it with sand and they sodded it. One of my biggest concerns is sodding on top of the sand because the sand could erode if you have a thin, fine fescue seed bed there. So a sand capping is an option. I've seen that done. It does tend to reduce the weeds in that, that fine fescue long-term. I would go out on a limb and say that we have weeks like we had in August this past year where it's hot and dry as you may actually have to irrigate fine fescue on sandy soils uh, to prevent turf loss. And goats and sheep, uh, could be considered biologically, but rarely have I seen these animals keep up with modern day standards. So uh, maybe they're useful for out of the way areas or for public perception, maybe, but uh, chances are not. Now we've done a lot of mowing studies. There's actually a, a fine fescue I have in my house. This is actually a uh, Aurora Gold hard fescue. It's an old fescue I established about 15 years and we do a lot of herbicide tolerance on this block. And uh, you can see the area on the left there is mown May 15th. This is actually 2021. The area on the right there was mowed April 15th. And what I did here is I, I wanted to do a mowing study to see how in 2021, how the time of mowing impacted seed head production. Well, you can see there it's spring. First of all, spring mowing is very beneficial, right? April 15th still produced that, that seed head. And maybe it's not as dense as you want to, but as you get into Mother's Day in May, you know, all mowing should be stopping and you should see that, that purple seed stalk begin to form. And they're going to go up to produce this, this straw colored seed into, into June as things dry out and warm up. So I definitely like that spring mowing there. And also it, it should make your herbicides work a little better by removing of some weeds and even getting a better seed, uh, uh, herbicide to weed contact by having less surface area by the seeds. And there's fine fescue roughs. Many of you have probably seen this over the years, that fine fescue like it's dry and warm, it do not like to be trafficked, right? They'll, they'll turn dormant, almost like bent grass does sometimes with golf carts running on there when it's hot and dry. Uh, but in the Northeast, you know, they see more of a fine fescue and uh, this is what happens. And this is why mowing in the heat, you know, if you came to me and said, Steve, our fine fescue areas are really weedy, it's gonna be 92, we haven't had rain in a week, should I mow it down? I would say, no, you could probably kill it pretty, or hurt, hurt it very badly. Now some logistics of weed control, I mentioned clippings already, but one thing to think about, you know, are the clippings so dense to preventing movement of the herbicide down to the soil under the roots properly, like a pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, does burning increase weed control? And this depends. I get, I get some questions and uh, I'm not sure everybody can burn based on their municipal localities around them, but there is a lot of golf courses in Pennsylvania that do burn. Actually, Longwood Gardens has a native meadow they burn every, every late winter, usually February. And think about the burning, turning the, the, the soil black, as well as heating it up in the springs, which are moving basically all the vegetation and exposing weed seeds. So one thing we see with, with um, burn is you tend to get more uh, worm seeds and grasses like little blue stem and your crabgrass foxtail tends to germinate a little earlier. So if you are gonna burn these areas, I would definitely try to get a pre-emergent herbicide on them as soon after you burn in the spring as you can. Best time to typically burn is that, that February, first week of March, when this, all the dander is dry, it's pretty crazy if you've never seen burn happen, it stops right at the mow line. There's just enough moisture in the plants that are mowed uh, versus the high grass areas that, that have, has that dander and debris there. And then can you safely stick a sprayer in these areas or will they um, require hand spraying? And I've seen some work with boomless nozzles. Uh, one of the things that concerns me is, is one drift as well as calibration properly. Now, if you left these areas unmowed, they would basically turn into the Canada thistle and poison ivy and eventually become trees. So I uh, definitely mowing them and hand spraying is an option for some. Um, really a lot of time and energy can be spent in these fine fescue areas. Just, this is somebody targeting just some quack grass and some yellow nut sedge with some segment and some uh, hella softer on sedge hammer. Now, I, I want to go through some weeds and mention, make some specific comments on these, but the foxtail, Japanese steel, steel grass, barnyard grass, druid heterothroxin, crabgrass, and, and, and um, goose grass are pre pretty much the only annual grass you're going to see. Remember, poanua is a winter weed. So here's barnyard grass, you know, has that really that 
crow's foot appearance is pretty good infestation of a barnyard. Foxtail, right, very common in high grass areas. Now, a newer one we've been seeing, I first saw this in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, and it's kind of spread out throughout the region. Uh, it's a newer invasive weed, it's called joint head orthroxin. And it's very similar to, to foxtail and barnyard grass, and it does extremely well in high grass areas, especially areas that are a little, little wet or a little shaded. Ironically, the control measures of joint head are very similar to those, those, those other grassy weeds. It does um, very sensitive to pre-emergent herbicides and a claim extra, phenoxyprop has good activity uh, on joint head if you're dealing with more joint head. One of the identification features here is you wanna see this world leaf orientation around those stems. There's a large meadow area that has um, a lot of joint head orthroxin. Now, very similar to Japanese stoke grass is these, these seed heads turn this purple to brown hue. About this time of the year, they look like this uh, when the first few cooler nights come through and then that'll hang around, their skeletons will hang around till spring. And then if left untreated with a pre-emergent herbicide, they'll germinate again, say in March and April. So some, some keys to summer annual grass control, pre-emergent herbicides are always best. Uh, consider applications twice per year. So for example, autumn, you could do barricades and then in the spring, do pendulum, for example, and then rotate through them when possible. Apply as soon as possible after you mow and prior to the, going to seed. If you have weed concerns in late summer, you know, germinating grasses, push that spring mowing back a few weeks, maybe late April, early May, and then apply your pre-emergent herbicide. For example, this year, if you had a lot of foxtail, which can be a late summer annual weed, meaning that germinates, say, in June, July, August, not in that May time from the crabgrass does sometimes, um, you could get better pre-emerging control of those late summer emerging annual weeds by pushing that back a little bit. Uh, what's also worse, looking at tire tracks or weeds, right? I would say weeds, in my opinion, are worse to look at. Some people do some creative things with driving the sprayers on different angles, maybe uh, perpendicular to the golf hole, for example, so people don't see the, the tire tracks on the tee going out. Uh, but think about that if you are struggling with some weeds, maybe put an extra spray in late May uh, while they're trying to go to seed, uh, even early June. Most years you can do that with a, with a herbicide. Now, winter annuals are less of a problem. Actually, I'm seeing more rat tail fescue, but these are uh, annuals that germinate now, say August through October, November, even December sometime. Uh, but rarely are a winter annual grass is a weed because of using uh, pre-emergent herbicides twice per year in these areas. So here's a poannua and fine fescue. There's some rat tail. Rat, rat tail looks a lot like fine fescues. It, it's a winter annual, though it actually goes uh, completely straw color and dies in June, whereas the fine fescues are green uh, still. They still have green leaves and stems. Uh, you see a lot of fine, uh, a lot of rat tail comes into newly seeded fine fescue areas. Now pre-emergent options here. I have barricade, I use the full label rate depending on what formulation of prodiamine you're gonna use. Pendulum Aquacat, one caution about pendulum is it can stain shoes and sprayers. And I had an issue a few years ago with a, a superintendent spraying about 30 acres of high grass areas. And then the, the dogs, they have a dog uh, walk party and the do dogs walk through the pendy in the, the morning of a spray and all their feet turned yellow. So I'd uh, be very careful with that. Uh, dimension. I, I'm going to hesitate here with dimension. Dimension should only be used on mature fine fescue. And people will question me. If you look at the dimension label, it clear as day says this herbicide can hurt certain varieties of fine fescues. And we've also done a lot of herbicide trials with it. We've seen it thin fine fescue significantly if it's young, less than two years old. Uh, so if you are using dimension safely, it shouldn't be an issue. If you have young turf out there, I would say stay away for at least 24 months. Uh, Ronstar is not labeled for this use. And then we have SureGuard, it's a newer option. Uh, if you're gonna try SureGuard, use it in the autumn when the fine fescue is semi-dormant, like right now. Uh, for example, say you're mowing area now, you got a few frost on there in the next month or so, and then try to apply that to a dry turf if possible. We're still figuring SureGuard out. Uh, we have seen it thin some fine fescues. We've seen it thin some roughs as well and some other active ingredients. But um, the keys here with pre-emergent options is mow in the spring. I try to time them with a light rainfall. I know that's easier said than done. And try to get as, as best of coverage as you can just for no skips. And some GPS sprayers may help with this uh, in the long term. Now, there's no way I can say all the annual broadleaf weeds that we see in golf courses, but here's the most common ones we see is American burnweed, uh, ragweed, pigweed, knotweed species, Pennsylvania smart, and many other options here. Uh, where funds are available for these annual broadleaf weeds, you may consider that the herbicide is oxybin. It's gallery, it's a trade name. There's some other post patent materials out there, but uh, Isoxabin is a pre-emergent for broadleaf weeds, so it's not cheap, but it does provide some, some uh, pre-emergent pre control if you really don't want to see these weeds out there. So here's American burnweed, and this is 
becoming more and more of an issue. And one of, one of the things I, I see with American burnweed is we're spraying more herbicides on fine fescue areas and we're controlling Canada thistles and other broadleaf weeds that probably were competing with the American burnweed. Once we eliminate that competition, we're going to shift that weed population to late summer germinating germ annuals. And American burnweed fits that bill where it germinates usually in July, kind of sits about two feet high until August, and then it bolts where it'll get seven, eight feet high within five weeks in September. And it's become a very uh, invasive weed. I had a, a member on a visit a few weeks ago say, do, do we plant that? Is, that? is that supposed to be there? And I said, no, 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 it's a weed. So um, pretty interesting to see this weed kind of shift. Now, perennial broadleaf weeds, this is kind of what we think about with clover and dandelions and ground ivy and wild violet. These are very similar to those, right? So thistles, uh, poison ivy can be a problem. Uh, also brambles, you know, like multiflora rose. And then once in a while, we'll see some woody plants like cedars, pines, even tulips get up pretty quickly in high grass areas and even crown vetch. And there's lots of herbicide options here. Speed zones, one, that's a four-way herbicide with uh, carfentrazone, so it has some quick knockdown. There's lots of options. There's, there's hundreds of options you can go with for broadleaf weeds. Uh, here's crown vetch. And we see vetch in a lot of golf courses actually be pretty tough to kill long-term. And there's got to be a lot of vetch seed in the soil. And vetch was actually recommended by a lot of people back in the day for soil stabilization because it tends to spread rapidly. And it's a, it's a leguminous crop, so it can fix nitrogen in, in poor soils and thrive. So vetch. Now, hundreds of options I mentioned. One thing I'm going to highlight here is I'm a big fan of, of, of ACC ACE inhibiting herbicides. Those are segment and fusillate, even a claim fits that bill, right? But there's a weird uh, antagonism that can happen with phenoxy herbicides like 2,4-D, MCPP, and MCPA with those. So you really wanna be very careful. You can't mix, say for example, segment with speed zone or a fusillate with speed zone and expect to get great control of grassy weeds or some antagonism there. So if you're gonna go after broadleaf weeds, do not mix any grassy herbicides short of Pilex and Drive and a few others out there. Now, most of the time, a conventional broadleaf weed material would be like 2,4-D, MCPP, MCPA, plus dicamba or fluoxapir or triclopyr. There's hundreds of options here, right? Uh, some people will use straight dicamba, which is Vanquish and others. Uh, it's going to be repeat applications. And some other options here are Confront or 2-D, Speed Zone, Shore Power, and Native Clean. And we're doing some work this fall with some Native Clean material. It's uh, aminopyrrolid plus 2,4-D. It's a newer herbicide, probably five or six years old from uh, Corteva. Now, when we begin to talk about perennial grassy weeds, we are in a whole new ball game, okay? This is a, a tougher game that's gonna require a lot of work and a lot of patience, right? These are grasses like Bermuda grass, right? We know what a big challenge Bermuda grass is in bent grass, right? Damn near impossible to kill, right? So quack grass, orchard grass, Bermuda, past palum, dwarf fountain grass, little and big blue stems when it gets too thick. Even bent grass can be an issue in fescue areas. It's a lot easier to kill though. Uh, tall fescue, uh, reed canary grass. There's a lot of options here, a lot of, a lot of weed challenges. And you know, here's quack grass, right? It's a very aggressive, cool season perennial that can take over left uncontrolled. The quack grass is going to require, it has these, these deep rhizomes down deep. You can see that like Bermuda grass. It's going to require probably two to four herbicides per year for a few years to potentially get high levels of control. And uh, the herbicides I mentioned here are very active on it, but it's like Bermuda grass, right? It has dense structures underground, which is going to recover and it has a lot of reserves there to come back from herbicides. So grass you can control in fine fescue native areas or high grass areas, right? ACC ACE inhibiting herbicides like segment and fusillate are safe on poa and fescue species only. Not tall fescue, just fine fescue. So it's a very niche herbicide. And be very careful with these herbicides around bent grass, around Kentucky bluegrass, Areas you could have drift or even they run off, they don't dry properly. So fusillate rates, uh, label rate 16, some go higher than 20. Segment is 36 ounces per acre for the old formulation. A new formulation of segment two, label rates 20 ounces per acre. Each golf course kind of will, based on their comfort level, maybe tweak these a little bit lower, higher, based on what they're trying to go after. Uh, MSMA is an old herbicide. No, know many people use that 30 years ago, but uh, it's a very strong on little blue stem past palum and some oddball grassy weeds like dwarf fountain grass sometimes. Uh, so if you are struggling with say, you know, little blue stems getting too thick, for example, which can happen, uh, spot spray and some MSMA is an option. Now other herbicide options in these areas, which fine fescues, once they're mature, have a very good tolerance to most post-emergent herbicides. So a claim extra you can use for deer tongue grass and Bermuda suppression mixed with turflon or confront. 
And a claim is a unique material because it has a lot, a lot of broad spectrum activity on, on deer tongue as well as it's safe on ryegrass, tall fescue, or bluegrass. So it gives that advantage and that interface where you maybe have a cool season rough and then have fine fescue areas beside that. Uh, if you have Bermuda grass, you know, rough versus a, a tall fe fine fescue, that doesn't matter much. Now, Pilex is also very safe on fine fescues up to an ounce and a half per acre. It will boost control of many grass seaweeds. For example, quackgrass control, we know a mixture of fusillade or segment plus Pilex plus an NIS will give you a very good knockdown of some of those difficult to control quackgrass weeds. Now, Queen Clorac Drive, it's very strong on deer tongue grass and foxtail post emergently. The keys with all these post-emergent grass seaweed herbicides is good soil moisture. I would mix most of, most, most of those with the NIS or methylated seed oil. And if you are having trouble with spot treatments of these grass seaweeds materials, most of the time it's because your droplet size might be a little off. Now, with the claim, when Bear was developing a claim, they did a lot of work with actual different nozzle tips. They found some of the, the coarser droplets did not provide great crabgrass control with the claim. It's part of the reason why a claim never got huge back in the day in lawn care applications using a large droplet gun uh, relative to Queen Clorac for crabgrass control because the coverage needed to be atomized and uh, really good coverage on these grassy weeds. So uh, most of the time you get good coverage and fine droplet size. So if you notice the difference between, say, a boom sprayer and backpack sprayers, it could be either the rate or the droplet size of the spray. I mentioned already be very careful on bank grass and other grasses. There's a fusillate and segment are only safe on fine fescues and poannua. It's a very niche herbicide. So I hear the applicator in the fall, say they went in October, they uh, got some fusillate or, or segment and use them to basically interchangeably in my, my opinion. Uh, so care should be taken when spraying near other species with these grasses. Uh, there was a the, the sprayer stop going up the hill there or slow down coming down. We don't we, we never know. But it's basically going to hurt that bluegrass and that, that bank grass for quite some time. Also in regular roughs, you can see this happen many times with the overspray. I tell people to err on the inside of that and then go back and mow that edge, uh, mow it down with a, a rotary mower, that regular rough height. And also be very careful with rock outcroppings and other areas of the golf course. If you know, herbicide is not going to completely dry, I have seen a number of herbicides run hundreds of feet down fairways. So be very careful if you, you have any rain coming through and you're trying to spray these areas and the herbicide potentially could move. Uh, we see this most commonly with Southern herbicides and you're trying to control POA, say in Bermuda and Georgia, but a very similar thing can happen in thinner turf rock outcroppings uh, with some of these herbicides as well. And one of, the, one of the issues that we're seeing a little bit more commonly is, is people love little blue stem and some of these native grasses, andropogons or big blue stems. And I hear questions about Indian grass and, and these native grasses that are native to the Eastern US. And one thing is that you begin to control all these other weeds in these areas, say that, the, I don't know, the poison ivy, for example, and the blue stem takes over. Uh, so we do have some good options here. MSMA, which goes by target at one ounce plus triclopyr, that can be used to suppress it while it's green, basically June through, June through September. I've seen most herbicides be pretty safe on little blue stems. So it's, it's interesting that MSMA plus turf will hurt it, uh, but you really want to get these while they're green in the, in the spring and summer if, you, if, it, if it does bother you. This golf course, this area is between the T and the fairway. You can see how much of a difficulty that would call, you know, cause for a high, high handicap or leaving their ball in that area. Uh, my also suggestion was to mow it more too, but they wanted to leave it up and let it go to seed. I get a lot of questions about tank mixing. So it's most common to target as many weeds as possible when you get into these applications. So I'm gonna give you an example program. This is not an endorsement, okay? This is not an advertisement. These are programs that I've seen work in my travels well, we've, we've trialed, right? Uh, so from a mature fine fescue that when no seeding is needed, right? You have the, enough grass out there or it's been a few years old and you're, you're comfortable with where it's at. In the spring, after you mow, say in April, you can use barricade plus gallery plus confront plus fusillade plus an, an IX surfactant. Now I want to talk a little bit about, about some density management here a little bit. So you could also mix some proxy primo with that if you want to. And look at these sprays and they're expensive. This is what I got out in my introduction, right? These areas will cost you more per square foot in labor at times and herbicides in at times than a mowed rough. Consider that you maybe use one pre-emerge and one post-emerge and you mow a rough, I don't know, 30 times a year. Versus an area you're going to mow three or four times a year and you're going to spend herbicides. So that's an option for the spring. Then in the summertime, spot spray with either turf lump plus fusillade or segment plus a sedge material if you have it, right? So uh, Pilex, excuse, you know, excuse me, um, sedge hammer or, or, or pro sedge uh, would be an example of a sedge material. Now, if you don't need the fusillator segment, you can use a three-way herbicide, Trimac Classic or Speed Zone, right? Just go after those broadleaf weeds. In the autumn, 
consider switching your pre-emerge option to an, a, a newer one, not, not, not a different chemistry, but a newer option. It could go pendulum plus T-zone or pendulum plus 2D or whatever you're going to use, uh, making sure that you're rotating through them. And also the best suggestion I have for you is don't get caught in a program every single year. Look at your weed pressure. Say you're seeing more American burnweed. Maybe you, you time that pre-emerge in the spring, maybe a week or two later, or you plan on doing more spot treatment when, as time allows in the summertime months. So you're going to create a shift. It's like anything. You put a heavy selection pressure on these weeds, you're going to see and observe new, new issues. Now, sedges can be a, a bigger problem. I tend to see more and more sedges in fine fescue. So I want to mention that in detail. Remember, sedges are, are, are perennials. They emerge from underground structures, right? Uh, each spring, they're most common in wet areas. And basically what we found is that uh, most herbicides, even ones that concern me on other grass, other cool season grasses like this mist are very safe on fine fescue. So Halosofteron, example here would be ProSedge or Old Manage from Monsanto, old herbicide sprayed in the 90s. Uh, Mazosofteron, which is Solero, and then Solfentrazone, which is Dismiss. There's a bunch of different Dismisses out there, Dismiss NXT, but I realize that Solfentrazone is pretty safe on, on, on fine fescue. I very rarely have seen any issues with that. And then a newer one I want to mention from PBI Gordon is Vexus, and that's a granular option. And that we've seen very good control in fine fescue areas with granulars applied Vexus, say, in, in the spring and May, for example, and in September, where it probably takes the herbicide in as it goes into dormancy in the fall. So uh, I have some, a lot of options there if sedge is an issue. Most commonly, it's, it's spot treated for, for sedge in high grass areas. Now, uh, when Eric and Bo reached out, they, they mentioned about some seeding, right? And this is actually a funny story where you know, a golf course seeds fine fescue, it gets inundated by weeds before they can even spray it, and then operations start over, right? So we're going to start over and um, reestablish this area of fine fescue. So this kind of goes to show you the history of fine fescues at many golf courses. And also it's interesting that golf courses that have success establishing fine fescues tend to, to do more, and golf courses where it gets too thick and weedy and fails, they tend to get less, right? So it's a pretty interesting thing. So from getting out there is the establishment of these is really critical and something that we've really fine-tuned the past few years. Uh, really most challenging, uh, as things like a consultant for me has been, you know, looking at these areas, someone will say, Steve, can I let this area go or maybe just spray uh, herbicides on there and then oversee it in the fall? And many clubs are starting to find out that this is probably best is to start over, meaning spray a couple laps around up on this in July and August, and then uh, reseed it with a good hard or sheep fescue. That's really the best way to do these areas. The other thing I would encourage you, I just thought of this, if you have some areas in your, your property that you think you may want to convert to a high grass area, maybe let them grow up in May, June, July, and see what it does to the public visual before you take all the time and kill it. If you don't know what you're going to get into, uh, maybe let it grow up a little bit uh, from an architectural standpoint and uh, see how it looks, and then, then maybe that fall, then kill that. An area like this, this is an interesting one. This is pretty good. Uh, it has about 15 to 45% fine fescue in there. You could probably treat this a lot differently with herbicides in that previous slide. You probably could spray, you know, say four or five, in the course of a year, four or five applications of fuselier and segment on that, and come in in the fall and have, you know, maybe a little spot seed. And you're probably gonna have a pretty decent stand of fine fescue the, pre the, the following year, but, um, you really want to make sure you don't have a lot of bluegrass and tall fescue and other grassy weeds are going to be difficult to control long term. So this site contains significant amounts of, of Bermuda, quackgrass. You have to kill it, right? I'm not going to say fine fescues are going to compete with that, but you want, just like anytime you want to set yourself up for success with any renovation. So fusillator segment mixed with glyphosate in late July, excuse me, yeah, late July, early August. Then I like to use straight glyphosate. Then about a month later, straight glyphosate again. Um, people don't want to wait, right? This takes patience, right? So this is one of the big challenges about fine fescues. Fine fescues as a whole are a very slow growing species of grass. And they're at times can be kind of frustrating to see, is it mature enough to handle a herbicide? But uh, start the process and kind of get the expectations out there. And then most of the time you want to see these areas by October 1st to October 15th. So today's October 13th. Hopefully if you are established in some of these this year, you have the seed in the ground. And then use tenacity at five fluid ounces per acre and in the seed bed and then every 21 days. And we found that tenacity has really increased the success rate in many of these fine fescue seed areas. Just by controlling the winter annuals uh, really is a huge help in chickweed control, hairy bittercress, it suppresses poannua. So here, here's an example of late, late in the fall, you can see the leaves are all turning orange and getting ready to fall. And that fine fescue right there is going to be money by next July 4th, right? So really good uh, catch there in the fall, clean up. And um, fescue is growing in peat efficient soils will turn pink, right? What will happen there? 
I would basically do a quick soil test. I'm gonna get through these next few slides um, before we run out of time. But uh, basically, fan fescues prior warrant at least a quick soil test to see if the phosphorus is good. It will turn pink, uh, purple, and uh, very stunted if phosphorus is low in the soil. So if you're above 25 ppm, uh, this is actually one of my favorite pictures I ever got. This is actually a golf course that was doing some major renovation work. And the entire area was shooting with Roundup in the fall in September. The left half was sod stripped and seeded with a hard fescue. The right side was seeded, not stripped. So this is an old Willie Park golf course in the Northeast. And so Poanua came into the stuff that was not stripped. This is crazy because it goes to show you how much Poanua sees in the top, you know, there is sod cut, the top half inch of soil, right? And it's ready to germinate rapidly as soon as you expose it to light and give it some water. And that no differences in the seed or the herbicide. The only difference in the left versus the right in the polo population was a sod cutter where they stripped some rough area out and moved, moved it to another spot of the golf course. If you are going to be using sloped areas, definitely using matting and hydro seeding these slopes is really important. Uh, also, if you're doing late winter, so say after October 15th establishment, I like mixing some oats or some other cover crops in there to reduce erosion. Remember, oats and other cover crops, alfalfa, uh, you can kill it out pretty simply with herbicides long term or just by mowing them down in the spring. So it uh, definitely helps. And fine fescues, there are slow, right? So you are going to see some winter annuals. This is what, I'm, what I mentioned. This area had not received any tenacity. This is a spring after a fall seeding. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see the pressure here from winter annual weeds. So establishment recap, right? Start early, right? So start early. So late July is a great time to start. A glyphosate three quarts breaker, depending on formulation, do two or three straight applications. Mostly want to use hard and cheap fescues. I'm not going to give you cultivars today because I know availability of these grasses can be uh, from day to day, right? Uh, but you want at least 90% hard in most of these mixes that you're going to allow to grow up. Chewings will work. Uh, people say I have chewings, can I use it? Chewings will work. Just realize it's not going to get that as straw color as, as the, uh, the, the beacon, uh, which is a, a hard fescue, 100%. And the name beacon is pretty good because it, it does you know, symbolize you know, out being in the middle of the water. Uh, so the breeders are pretty good with naming grasses, right? At uh, two to three pounds, right by October first, yeah, October fifteenth. Hydro seeding is a great option, and then at seeding, use tenacity with two or more applications donated the part. And then the spring, people get it all caught up because they're worried about herbicide tolerance. If the fescue is more than two inches tall, it's going to be tolerant to most herbicides in the first spring. So I like pendulum as a pre. Uh, the first year, and then from that point forward, you can figure it out as far as your pre's. But a uh, pendulum is the safest option in the first year of fine fescue. Tenacity has definitely been a game changer as far as winter annuals. Uh, four or five ounces per acre, repeat applications until winter sets in. So you could say seed October 1st, spray tenacity, spray October November 1st, and then maybe 21 days, days later, you know, before uh, fall, and it gets cold. Once it stops growing at all, uh, stop the herbicides. Now, other ways to establish it, right? Obviously, fine fest can be cut in from a seed box there or hydro seed there on the, on the right. Uh, slice seed in more open areas and hydro seed in more sloped or tight areas is definitely the best two ways. Uh, many people actually have a lot of successes broadcasting uh, fine fescues into a thin, open soil, you know, say an area you renovate or, or drag, you know, limbs out, you do some uh, underbrush work, you broadcast and drag it around with a harrowtine drag map. I'm always impressed at how that works as far as fine fescues go as well. So here, here will be a, what, what the spring looks like from a fall height or uh, cut slice seed. Uh, as long as the majority of fescue is two inches tall in the spring, like it is here, uh, it's going to be very tolerant to most other herbicides short of dimension, right? Uh, here's a photo from dimension label that kind of protects me from getting an email from uh, some salespeople. Uh, but years ago, Dow had some sales reps that were very unhappy with me, and they, I got an email from them about, you, have, you, know, you, you can use dimension on fine fescue, and we, I've seen it, heard it. So uh, it says right there, two stars, do not use a certain variety of fine fescues, undesirable turf injury may it result. Uh, the fine, fine fescues are, are known to be sensitive, right? Uh, but basically it does say, I, I don't suggest use on, on fine fescues that are less than two years old. If, you, if you're using it with no issues, keep going. If you have not used it and you've done some seeding, be very careful with the mention on first year fescue. All right, last topic I wanna take, I got a few seconds left here. A density management of fine fescues, right? We gotta consider our goals, right? PGRs are very effective to reduce the overall height and even seed heads when applied in the spring. Think about, review like how fine fescues grow in your mind, right? You see them kind of turn green in March and April, they go to seed during May and June, that seed stalk sits there. It doesn't get any higher, right? So many times these grasses are maybe growing for 60 to 75 days per year. So if you can kind of keep them more truncated or more compact, 
potentially they're going to have less biomass produced, less growth, and less seed head production, right? So uh, people will mechanically thin them, right? They beat them with vertical mowers. I've seen all types of VC60s or even run like a cedar box through them with no seed and just rake that debris out. I uh, try to thin them as well. So I've seen all types of creative ways to thin these. And uh, this right here maybe is somebody's idea of a, a perfect thin, fine fescue, right? To me, it's a little thin. You're still seeing some dirt. But many times people will say, hey, that's an awesome fescue area. And I, I agree. That's, that's a good one. You're going to find a ball, you can apply it. But that's actually... Uh, a lot of herbicides and a lot of density. So uh, there are some herbicides out there that have some very significant effects on seed heads. Uh, BASF, a while back, realized that this, I had a superintendent in New Jersey one time, he says, Steve, I can't figure out why my fescue didn't go to seed. And I, like, I'm looking at it. Said, uh, hey, any chance you applied dimethenamide or, or tower to your fine fescue? He goes, yeah, we did because we had a major sedge issue last year. We applied it in, in April. And, and the, the tower label, if you look it up, clearly says there at the bottom, it says, um, do not apply to areas that uh, you want seeds, right? It's very, very, uh, pretty clear. And um, it says, uh, tower may be used to control weeds and naturalized grass areas on specific lists of weeds. Some species may have reduction or elimination of seed heads. It says it clears day on the label. So uh, you, there are certain herbicides that will do that. Uh, many times it's actually too good though. It's too effective at seed heads. You won't get any of that brown hue out there. Now, years ago, we looked at, um, this is actually Aurora Gold GT, which actually the GT there stands for glyphosate tolerance. It's a cultivar, a hard fescue that they knew had a, a pretty good tolerance to glyphosate or Roundup up to about 20 ounces per acre of the commonly used formulation of, of glyphosate. But uh, we looked at Embark, right? Now, now, I know Embark's off the market unless you have some, but I discovered, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, that Proxy Primo, one application in the third week of April would really suppress the seed heads here, single app. You can see the area around this trial area on golf course, you know, it was really it was about knee high fescue, really dense, gnarly, fine fescue area. And the, the plots we did our trial on there were, were pretty effective. So we had Embark plus Roundup, Embark alone, and then Proxy Primo. And I said to myself, man, this, this is pretty effective. So uh, the rates there, I'll, I'll give them to you, are 20 ounces per acre of the proxy and five ounces per thousand, excuse me, 20 ounces per acre of Primo, five ounces per thousand of proxy. I'll, I'll repeat that. It's not on the slides. Primo at 20 ounces per acre, proxy at five ounces per thousand, right? So I had a golf course this year do that exact same program and they had some skips and he called me and goes, Steve, you got to look at these skips from the sprayer. Uh, so you can see them clear as day there. So that's uh, with the spring applied herbicide. So see, he applied a pre and a post herbicide with the proxy Primo. So there's, there's the rates. I knew I had them in here. Proxy at five, Primo at 20. Uh, you can see that that fescue tree with the proxy primo is about six inches lower, and you can actually see some green stems in there. It's thinner, right? So it's still a, a really good quality fescue, maybe a little thick in some of your mind, uh, but realize if you are struggling with density, you don't have time to beat these areas up and mechanically thin them. There are some ways chemically you can do that, but once again, these are increasing our inputs into so-called naturalized areas. So what we see here with this is we see overall density reduction. You can see the applicator here skipped the edge of the car path. It's a different golf course. Uh, still find ball sometimes, still advance it. I'm not going to say this is the, 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 the solution to this problem, but it does help with density management if you are struggling with that. Uh, lastly, I want to mention with white grubs uh, and chinch bugs real quick. These areas, you cannot forget insecticides. I, I hate to say that. I wish you could. Uh, I took these photos actually this weekend uh, at a golf course. and a Fine fest, you have about, I don't know, 10 acres of damage from skunks and raccoons. Uh, I really wanted to put a trail cam up and see actually what it is because they were actually ripping through these roughs, uh, maybe a family of skunks or whatever. But um, man, they were going through white grubs. These were chafer grubs and some uh, Japanese beetles. But uh, something to think about, you know, a cell print can be pretty darn effective on white grubs when applied in April and May. So if you are spraying herbicides, you know, we know a cell print's probably going to last our longest for white grubs. Now, the downside of a cell print can be chinch bug. Uh, in the summertime months, but if white grubs are a primary issue, I definitely think about uh, those applications. If you, if you can't afford a celeprin and uh, you have other options out there, like summer applied imidacloprid, and um, there are some other options, but the key there is they're going to be more time sensitive to be applied in June and July. So insect control and fine fescues, two biggest challenges here are the chinch and white grubs. Uh, definitely some options here, uh, but the challenge can be thatch and, as well as lack of irrigation. Uh, Celeprin at 8 to 12 ounces per acre in high value areas is probably your best bet at this point. Uh, Neonix plus pyrethroids can be used in June, July for chinch bug. Uh, some people are considering some granular options here. So you walk a, a chest spreader through the areas. They have high value fescue. They don't, they don't want to drive tire tracks through them, either from a Vicon uh, or a sprayer. I, I get that. Uh, so small isolated areas definitely could be treated by hand. Uh, here's bug damage and fescues. Basically, they, they chewed up everything.
but the American burnweed. So if you have a history of, of insect damages in these areas, it's definitely worth treating. And with that, I'm about five minutes late, but uh, I'll take any questions if anybody has them. But uh, thanks to Landscape Supply again for the invite. Thanks, Steve. I uh, appreciate it. And I, I should, I failed to mention earlier on in uh, the beginning was that we've got uh, Walker Supply and 10 Barge people here on board. So I want to welcome all of them and their customers that joined us. Uh, we're a growing company, Steve. So uh, we keep adding to our portfolio and and uh, we're, we're glad you're part of us. And, and uh, we've got, you know, uh, representation basically from the Midwest all the way up into Pennsylvania now. Um, and so excited to have those guys on board for this this seminar as well or webinar questions from the group out there uh, you can use the chat function or raise your hand i can unmute you if you want to ask a question steve is uh you mentioned some mechanical for ways to uh, thin out some of these areas what i see a lot in my travels is really dense thick um areas that they're you know kind of left on mode especially this time of year with all the the growth a any applications outside of the primo proxy that you've seen went um work well on, on thinning these areas down to make them a little bit more playable that's what actually do that like like triclopyr turf fly is actually a pretty darn good regulator um and that's part of the reason why it plays a role in some of those programs it's just a balancing point there you know Eric, if you read the, the Roundup label, it actually has a term called chemical mowing, right? You actually use low rates of glyphosate to, to chemically mow or thin turf, right, you know, without killing it. Uh, so there's definitely some options there if people wanted to try them. I'm really hesitant, to obviously, to use those because of drift and other concerns. What are you going to get out of that? Um, the, the proxy primo and mechanical thin are probably two of the most successful ways I've seen that, whether it's a, a BC60 or some, I don't care what it is, to make it break up some soil and, and actually manually remove some plants, almost like you do on a, a fairway or a tee or a green to get it firmer, um, but uh, just physically remove some plants and then uh, put a herbicide on there just to prevent you know, weed seed from coming. That's my biggest concern about mechanically thinning stuff is bringing weed seed up. Um, we see that quite a bit where you expose soil and you're gonna change your weed dynamic as well. I see a question here. Thank you for that. Uh, but we, we have a question from Matt Lanthrop. Uh, what treatment would you consider to keep woody plants out of native areas? So it, it depends on, on the grass. If it's all fine fescues, I would definitely re rely upon uh, chemicals that contain triclopyr. Triclopyr or turflon, as example, garlon, uh, are definitely the strongest on most woody plants. So it's, um, you know, hemlocks or poison ivy or woodies. Uh, triclopyr, even, even high rates of other herbicides will get that. But, but um, yeah. Triclopyr, straight, garlon uh, are probably your best options uh, for that. And when would you apply those? Uh, they should be applied when they're actively growing. So that would probably be from April through June. And then again in September and October. Great. Any other questions from the attendees? Well, we've got a few minutes here in closing. I just want to say a few things. First and foremost, Steve, thank you for all that you do for our industry. Uh, I see you travel in the world. And, um, you know, I know a lot of the sacrifice that you're making with your own family and doing that to support this industry. So thank you for that. Uh, it doesn't go unrecognized. And, and I know from us here, at the WS Conley family of, of uh, distributors, you know, we appreciate what you do out there uh, to make make this industry better and, and help us educate it. You know, talking about education, um, you know, as part of the, the landscape supply and Walker supply and 10 barge uh, values, education is a big part of our company. Uh, we appreciate partnering with people like yourself. We've put together these learn webinars that will continue to grow uh, in popularity, but we've got uh, one every month scheduled and we were going to continue that to move forward into 2023 it's the second thursday of the month uh, you can reach out to your sales representative or follow us on twitter uh, we, we've got plenty of advertising to try to get these uh, educational opportunities out there in addition to that if you have some topics of of concern that you want us to to bring up a, on a webinar or speakers please reach reach out to us i'm i'm leading the charge on the learn webinars and uh, love education, love providing education to this industry. 
And uh, there's a great deal of topics and a great deal of speakers that we can bring into this. So next month, we've got Bill Maynard, uh, former president of GCSAA. He's going to talk about building uh, successful careers in our industry. So another great topic for our young uh, up and coming assistants and even existing superintendents um, that will do that on November 10th is that date. And then again in December, we've got one that will be Pat Jones talking about the state of the industry and where we're going. And then in January, we're going to have a soils first one with the Earthworks group. Uh, Joel Simmons and, and Jack Higgins are going to join us for a three hour soils first webinar. And then we're going to have a whole release of uh, more education through the spring and summer of next year. So please join us uh, for these. I hope you find value in what we're offering. So again, thanks, Steve, for all that you've done uh, and continue Thank to you. do. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Yep. See you. Thank you, guys.